So, if you want a title for today's sermon, and we're, we're really kind of looking at how we do life in some ways, it's titled By Myself But Never Alone. By Myself But Never Alone. And you, you soon read your Gospels, you, you, you begin to discover that Jesus was by himself a lot, but he was never alone. <coughs> He was never alone, but he was by himself. The only time he was alone was at the cross. Okay? Other than at the cross, he was never alone because God was there, the Spirit of God was there. And for us, because of his loneliness, we are never alone. Amen? We are never alone. We might be by ourselves, and we go through tough times in life, and we feel very much by ourselves, but we're never alone. Amen? And the enemy will deceive you in thinking you're alone in the situation. And we're not alone in the situation. We might be by ourselves, but we're not alone. Amen? Now, in today's society, one of the biggest claims is loneliness. Loneliness is absolutely one of the biggest problems in society. And it's involuntary loneliness, where people are just left and people don't visit them or care about them or they don't make things and it's voluntary loneliness where we live in society and we're slowly cutting ourselves off from everyone because of modern technology and pandemics and this and that and all sorts of things and we end up alone and I was watching a documentary last week on Tyson Fury the boxer a great big man narrative that he is and in the interview he was and he suffered with for years with depression, anxiety, attacks, and loneliness. He said he was so alone, he was so frightened. He said, What have I got to be frightened of? Look at the size of me. Who's going to do anything to me? He said, But you know what? I was an adult, happy to sleep with the light on in my bedroom with my wife because I couldn't sleep in the dark because I felt so alone. When the light went off, he said, It just got worse. And you think, you know, what a massive guy. He shouldn't have any fear. But it was absolutely petrified of being alone. Amen? And to lay a foundation, we're going to look at Adam and Eve. And God created, God created humans primarily for worship with him, for fellowship with him. That was the purpose of creating them, to, to, to have fellowship and be together. That's why Ricky was created, to have fellowship with God and to be in a relationship with God. And then to be in a relationship with other people. The creation of Eve was not primarily for the purpose of procreation. It wasn't created for the purpose of having babies and extending the human race. That was not her purpose. That was the result of the fall. Her purpose was to be a companion for Adam. That was the purpose of her creation. So a lot of uh, women, when you know, men say, oh, they're just made for having babies. Wrong. They weren't made for having babies. Yes, they had babies. Why did God choose for women to have babies and not men? Because women are, are stronger than men. They, they are. Come on. Women are more... I've seen babies being born out of this little midget. <laughs> Never! I'm like, oh my God, you can't possibly... No, how could you... I felt guilty that she was even pregnant. You know, the most awful thought for me in the, in the world is being pregnant. Can you imagine? Wait, imagine me pregnant. Well, I don't imagine. Can you imagine? Just the thought of something living inside you. I've seen the film Alien. I couldn't cope with the thought of someone living inside me. Oh, it's disgusting. <laughs> but her primary purpose of Eve was not for procreation. It was to be a helper to Adam, to be a companion for Adam. That was the primary... Uh, ladies, ladies, Frank, Claire, can you keep it down, please? It's distracting. Uh, that was the primary purpose, okay? And sometimes our purpose can get confused or distracted, okay? Never be distracted from your purpose. That's what the enemy wants to do. Distract you from your call. Distract you from your purpose. 
distract us from our relationships. That's the ploy of the enemy. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. Amen? A suitable helper. So God looks at Adam and he creates Eve as the best matching suitable helper for him. And it was the first time in all creation, since the beginning of creation, that God declared something is not good. He said it is not good for man to be alone. But hang on a minute, he, he had God and he had all the animals and everything else, but it still wasn't good, because we're also created for fellowship. Amen? Verse 19. Now the Lord had formed out of the ground all the wild beasts, of the ground, all the birds in the sky. He brought them to see the man, to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So this was basically the first ever version of Love Island. It was, it was the first ever version of Blind Dunk. <laughs> and everything's been created and God's there and looked and he said, oh, we've got to find a partner for Adam. So God parades everything in front of them. You know, and Adam's looking at the giraffe and he's a bit, bit, bit tall that way and the antelope, well, that's a bit low. The hippopotamus is, no, I ain't even going to go there. What did we leave But none suitable. There was nothing suitable. Now Mark and Sheryl will get married next week. Yeah. And they're not suitable to each other. Hallelujah. They're suitable. And God creates that that is suitable to each other, to itself. Amen? But no suitable help was found for Adam. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Whilst he was sleeping, he took one of the men's uh, man's ribs and then closed the place with flesh. The Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. For she was taken out of the man. Amen? So we see that the only suitable help, that nothing's going to work unless you put together in your life what God has got for you in your life. Okay, now we talk about Adam and Eve and creation of the human race. But no matter what it is, you need to be in the right place, okay? You need to be in the right place. You need to have the right relationships, the right friendships, the right people around you. You need to be living in the right area, by the right house, be in the right career. And you might say, well, it doesn't, you know, we've got to, you have, but it's in God's best. Seek God's best, the best he's got for you. Don't settle for second best. And sometimes you might think God's best is the bigger mansion, or sometimes God's best is the little tiny two up, two down house. And that's God's best for you. Yeah. God's best for me is not necessarily what, or my best for me is not necessarily the same as God's best for me. Mm. So you have to seek, Lord, what is your best in the situation? And sometimes when God shows you his best, you think, well, I don't really like it. I don't really like it. I mean, it's a nice try, Lord, but I'm not impressed. I don't think that's the best for me. I would rather have this. But do you know what? God is sovereign. He knows what's coming down the line. He knows every detail about you. He knows what is best for you. And when we're willing to receive God's best, you'll find contentment and you'll find peace. Because you're living in the will of God. Amen? I've said this before, there's, there's one thing knowing God's will, it's another thing knowing God's way. And there's a difference between the two. Okay? A servant, I've said this with my Cassandra, a servant can go and make me a cup of tea. I can say to Eniola, Eniola, go and make me a cup of tea, please. And as a servant, as a friend, she'll go off and she'll come back and she'll say, there's a cup of tea. And I'll look at it and say, yes, you have fulfilled the instructions, that is a cup of tea. 
but it's got too much milk and it's not got enough sugar and it's not hot enough. Yes, you've fulfilled the instruction, you've completed my will in bringing me a cup of tea, but because you don't know me intimately enough, you haven't done it my way. See, and you move in your relationship with God from just being almost a servant in fulfilling God's will to then fulfilling God's will, God's way. But it's not enough just to fulfill God's will. You've got to do it God's way as well. See, that's when you know the heart. Amen? So if I say to Ricky, who's the son in the Lord and everything, and I say, Ricky, can you make me a cup of tea, please? He knows me so intimately and do a fantastic job. It'd be just how I like it. Now, they've both fulfilled my will. We can both, we can all fulfill God's will. But isn't it richer, purer, greater and better to fulfill God's will, his way? Amen? And that's so important. So, so, so important. And that's a level of maturity, and that's a level of intimacy, and it's also a level of self-sacrifice sometimes. Amen? But to fulfill his will, his way. Now God made, uh, took a rib from Adam. He didn't make her from the head to be over Adam. He didn't make Eve from the feet to be trampled down by Adam, but rather from the side of Adam, Adam to co-heir with Adam, to be a partnership. We are not cavemen in a marriage where we say, God, you've got to obey me and that's it. End of, end of story, end of argument. No, that's not our marriage. Says. In actual fact, Scripture says that a wife should obey her husband as is fitting in the Lord. Not in anything, willy nilly. She can't obey me in sin or whatever. She obeys me as is fitting in the Lord, Scripture says. Okay, we're not cavemen, we're a partnership. Amen? She's all the richer for having me in, my life, in her life and I'm all the richer for having her in my life and we make decisions together. We discuss things together and then we reach a conclusion. And the only reason I might have the final say is because I have the final responsibility. Your level of, of authority only extends to the level of your responsibility. If you're not willing to take responsibility, then how can you have authority? You want authority, but you won't take responsibility. Why should you have responsibility over other people that you're not willing and uh, authority over other people if you're not willing to take responsibility for them? And yet you want authority over them. You want to come preach, you want to do this, you want to do the other. But you're not willing to take any responsibility. Therefore, you don't have the authority. You get authority when you're willing to take responsibility. Amen? So God saw Adam's aloneness and said, this is not good. Now, when God created in Genesis... The things he said were good. He said light was good. He made light. He said, that's good. Land of sea, that's good. Vegetation and fruit, that's good. Day and night, that's good. Sea creatures and winged birds, that's good. Wild animals, that's good. And after the creation of man, he looked at man and the Lord declared, that is very good. Amen? Very good. But then when he saw Adam alone, he said, this isn't good. The situation isn't good. Not that it wasn't saying Adam wasn't good. He said the situation is not good. And sometimes we can take things the wrong way. Your situation, I might say to my children, this situation is not good. But it doesn't mean to say I'm saying they're not good. No, you are good, but the situation you're in isn't good. Yeah. Amen? And sometimes we can take rejection very easily when the Lord is trying to get us out of a situation because he loves us and we think we're being rejected. You know, there are some relationships you've been rejected from and God probably did it on purpose to get you out. And you needed to be rejected out of that situation or that relationship because in the long run it would be bad for you. And sometimes God will eject you from the place of your, your comfort zone. It will take you out of it. 
so important. Even with our evangelism and reaching out to other people, you know, that, that we have to be injected out of our comfort zone. I was in Morrison yesterday and there's this big, big uh, black fella security guard, you know. I mean, don't worry about running out the door. You couldn't, you couldn't squeeze through the door with this guy. I mean, he's proper big. And he didn't smile either, just like... <laughs> so I walked up to him and said, you are, mate? Oh, oh, I'm up top, big top. Said, you Nigerian? I'm not a Nigerian. I'm from Zimbabwe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? She said. But we got chatting and we had a good laugh and I was able to minister to him and talk to him about the Lord and I gave him a church leaflet. But you know what? I had to do it out of my comfort zone. Yeah. You know? I had to be spurred by the Holy Spirit and then I had to be obedient to go and do it. Now we see uh, shortly after the creation of Adam and Eve, Satan steps in as a serpent and deceives Adam and Eve. And the result is of the deception was sin and separation. And Satan will always try to pick you off. Always try to try and drive you out on your own. Try and get you away from the body of Christ. You know, there's so many weird and wacky groups out there everywhere and uh, so many are in rebellion against this and we're rebellion against that and we don't like this and we don't like that and often the enemy comes and drives a wedge even in relationships or marriages or good friendships and the enemy is always trying to drive a wedge to bring separation. Amen? And that's the ploy of the enemy from the days of Adam and Eve to today and to, to, to tomorrow. The church should be winning a whole lot more battles than it does win because we know the way the enemy works. And yet sometimes we're running around with our eyes shut, all shocked by what the enemy's done. Other times we're blaming the enemy for what he's not done. And Satan's sitting there in, in Hades and said, well, mate, you ain't putting that one on me. No way. You know? And so we have to, we have to really fine tune. You've got to fine tune your walk with the Lord. Fine tune your ear to the Holy Spirit, especially in this day and age. It's hard to stand up. Pearl, you really bless me. Happy birthday, by the way. She's twenty. She turned up there. Uh, but you really bless me this week. Do you know why you bless me? Because I read half of the rubbish you put on Facebook. <laughs> No, it's not rubbish. But I read some of your stuff. And this girl, 20, good-looking, smart, intelligent woman, and on her top 20 things she's learnt in life, number one, God. And then she lists all these other things. But number one, God. And I loved it. And then she was putting other stuff up about life. But you could see her love for God, that her barometer was God first in whatever the situation. That's my bar. God first and then I deal with everything else. And I'm just saying, well done. Because it really blessed me and that will speak to so many people. It really will. And that in itself is evangelism. Yeah. See, the gospel demands a verdict. Yeah. Amen? The gospel demands a verdict. He either is or he isn't. Mm. Lord. You know? And our lifestyle and how we live um, amplifies that verdict. You know? So anyway. Um, so after sin came in, God then banishes Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. And we can say, well, that was really harsh by God. But God, by causing that banishment towards Adam and Eve, was actually a blessing towards Adam and Eve. He was doing them a favour. Because they'd sinned, they'd fallen short, they'd taken from the tree of knowledge and now had this knowledge and sinners come in. Okay? And God says if we leave them in the garden, they will have access to the tree of life. And if they take from the tree of life as well, they will be eternally stuck in separation. It would be the worst case scenario for the whole of humanity. So they had to leave the garden to preserve them and the whole of humanity. Genesis 3.21 says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, 
The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be able to reach out his hand and also take from the tree of life and eat it and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which it had been taken. And it was God's mercy which was being shown when he banished Adam and Eve from the garden. It was his mercy. Because if he took from the tree of life, Adam would eternally be separated from God because he would have received eternal life, meaning he couldn't die. But the issue of sin has not been dealt with. Sin has not been conquered. Jesus was going to conquer sin at the cross. And because he was gaining eternal life potentially at that point, he would have been stuck eternally, separated from God. Wow. See, sometimes we get upset maybe with the way God treats us, so it doesn't work out, but we fail to see the bigger picture sometimes, and, and what God is doing sometimes is for our benefit, even though at times it can be hard and it can be lonely. And Adam must have felt rejected. He must have already felt alone, because God said it's not good for him to be alone. Now he's having to face rejection from the Lord as well. He's been kicked out. And, and you imagine being Adam. Up to that point, it, there'd been no decay, no sin. There hadn't been a single butterfly that had died. Not one moth. Crocodiles, you could brush their teeth with a sponge. There was absolute wonderful, nothing. And suddenly, from the point of sin, the world that Adam looked in, suddenly, death, decay, has got a hold. Suddenly, there's weeds. He's never seen a weed in his life. Suddenly, there's death, decay, and weeds. What must have that felt like for Adam? And he's been pushed out of the Garden of Eden to uh, work the ground. Now, as I said, Satan's agenda is always to separate. Okay, that's his purpose. But we were made for relationship. Amen? You were made for me, and I was made for you. Amen? Whether you like it or not, it's reality. We were made for relationship with one another. And we should give ourselves to one another. We should. It's hard. It's tough. Why? Because we get hurt. We have mistrust. People have let us down. And self-preservation comes in and we can become sceptical and these sorts of things. And we've been rejected before and stuff like that. And so in the end, we don't love completely. We love with a limited love. We love people so far, but I can't let you write in because you might cause damage. And so we love with a, with a wall of protection over us to protect ourselves because of the world that we live in the way people are. You know, not all humans are as lovely as me. It's, it's, I found that out. You know, but it's true. But we're then not giving a, you know, we're called to love each other as we love the Lord. You know, and that's why I love Peter because he had to learn the hard way. So we, we live in a semi-alone state sometimes, even though we're members of a church and we've got family around us and everything else. We can still live in a semi-alone state because we can't give ourselves completely because if I give myself completely, then what? What if I get hurt? And if I get let down like I was let down last time and I was let down by this and I was let down by that and I had friends and they betrayed me and they walked away. But see, there's something inside where the Holy Spirit resides in your life that yearns to be vulnerable. Yearns. But our flesh and our emotion comes in and says, oh, oh it's prickling. What if? As well as modern day society. When Jesus is questioned by the teachers of the law in Matthew 22, verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. 
They love Jesus. They're trying to outmaneuver and outwit Jesus uh, by asking, what is the greatest commandment? But Jesus doesn't reply to their question properly because they're expecting one. What is the best one? What's the highest one? What's the greatest one? But Jesus replies with the two. And he tells them the greatest and the second greatest. The first and the second. And he's basically said, if you don't love your neighbour as you love yourself, guess what? You're not going to fulfil the first one. There's a lot of flaky Christians who turn around and say, I can love God just on my own, sitting in my living room, I don't need any other Christians. Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes, you can emotionally love God like that, but it's not a true love because true love sacrifices. You know, if, if I love Mara and I've got to put up with some hardship from other people because I love her, well, that's true love. Because I'm putting up with the grief as well that other people might cause me, and vice versa. So when we really love each other, what other people think doesn't matter. Mama's family didn't even come to our wedding. Refused to come. You know? And I had my doubts whether I would go. But I did. No, I had my <laughs> No, I had, I had my doubts. But, sorry, Mum. I'm not sure what color I'd leave. No. I chilled my time. She went for a siesta on the way. No. I I actually had my doubts on the morning. Will she marry me? Because I knew her family weren't coming. And I thought, will she hold out? But when she realises her mum and dad aren't going to come, purely because they didn't want her to live in England and marry me, uh, will she think, I just can't do it to that. I just can't do it to my family. But her love for me outweighed the consequences of being embarrassed because her family didn't turn up. So we got married, the church was full of people, but... She had just two sisters and two cousins there. That was it. My, one of my best mates walked her down the aisle. Not many women would do that. But her love for me was far greater than the consequences. And when we get to the point that we love each other, and our love for each other is greater than the consequences of failure. You know? The end um, Forgive me if you're not a boxing fan, but the Anthony Joshua fight last night, you know, I watched it on YouTube afterwards. Did you know Anthony Joshua, the British heavyweight, big guy, looks like Isaac, but he's more that way. Well, <laughs> he, he went for this fight, and do you know what? He didn't turn up. He was there in body, but he wasn't. His heart was not in that fight at all. And he got mashed up, he got beaten, he lost all his titles, yet, he is probably more than capable to win that fight, physically. But mentally, he, didn't try. he did not want to be in the ring. He didn't want to fight. I thought, what's wrong with him? Why is he not? You know? And sometimes you can live through your relationships not wanting to turn up. You give a part of yourself, but not all of yourself. And we end up, we're lonely because we cause ourselves to be isolated. Show yourself friendly, and you will have friends, you know? It's quite simple. Characters in the Bible who suffered severe loneliness. Joseph, Moses, David. And yet David's relationship with the Lord was probably the most fantastic. But he still suffered with loneliness. Why? Because we need each other. God, do you know how God fulfills the loneliness in your life? He don't flutter down and say, I'm here with you, Ricky, I'll hold your hand, let's watch these enders together. He don't do that. He fulfills the loneliness in your life by saying, I know a quite sized pastor and I'm going to stick him in your life to prevent you from being lonely. He gives us each other. You know? But when we won't give ourselves to each other, then we sit there whinging, we're lonely, I feel isolated, don't feel a part of anything. You know, it ain't rocket science. David in Psalm 142, verse 4. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge and no one cares for my life. 
That's how he felt. He felt utterly abandoned and all these emotions that he was going through. And they overthrew. And sometimes I felt like that. I've been married with three children and felt completely isolated, absolutely lonely. I've really felt that. I pastored uh, a church of over 300 people. I was so lonely, so isolated. I had all leaders around me and people with ministry and gifts coming out of the ears and all these different things. I was so lonely in it. And you could have been in a room with thousands and be utterly isolated. Elijah, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, the woman with the issue of blood, Paul, Jesus, all suffered with periods of loneliness and isolation in their lives. We've all struggled at various times with isolation and being lonely. And sometimes it's very real. But you might be on your own, but you're never alone. You might be by yourself, but you're never alone. Why? Because we've had God. We had the Holy Spirit residing in us. There were times that you want to be alone without the Holy Spirit there because you know you're going to sin or you know you've done something wrong and you just kind of, you'll be back off from the Lord as if to think, he can't see us. Well, I, I won't phone my friends, I won't go to church, I won't do this because I know my life's not quite right. And we think, oh, because of that, God can't see me. We had a friend years ago and uh, his children, the boy was quite shy. And when they used to do stuff in church, up on the platform, we'd get very shy. So what he used to do, he used to put his hand over one eye and just look with one eye because he thought, well, if I can't see them, then they, they can't see me, you know? And all it what happened, he looked cute but stupid. He put himself in danger of falling over, you know? So we had to uh, realise these things. We are never alone as Christians. We are welcomed into the family of God. We are members of the family. Therefore, we need to have eyes to see one another. We are a family. Amen? Do you know, a lot of teenagers go through the phase of living in their bedroom. <laughs> living in their bedroom, preferably with the curtains shut because they turn into vampires for about five years and they dare to add sunlight, well, open the curtains and let daylight come into the room, you know? And then they, they start collecting things like plates, 15 of them, glasses. The other day he's walking downstairs and he's got all this, he looked like a waiter in a restaurant, he's got all these glasses like this, and he tried to sneak, I saw you, son. He tried to sneak through to the kitchen without me. I saw him, he's suddenly walking along like this. <laughs> I know, mate. But they may be, but I said, you know what, you got away with that, but, you know, even with my children, we're a family. You're not going to live on your computer 24 hours a day. I don't care. You're part of this family. You will participate. That means it's your turn to go and pick the dog's paw up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the one. He made the thing to get the dog. He chose the dog, actually. He chose the dog. And after twisted arm to go and pick up the... You could have said no. <laughs> what? You could have said no. I could have said no. I could have said no, but I didn't, did I? No, okay. But even with their children, we don't... You know what, this phase of being in isolation for five years, it's not happening, Caleb, Leah and Luke. We are a family and you live in the house and you will call your wife and you will smile as you do it. I can remember saying to my daughter, right, you're 14, okay? Your body's going to change, your moods are going to change, but you live in this house so you will walk around with a smile. I'm not getting up every day to, morning Leah. Mm. You know, they, they even lose the ability to talk. Everything becomes a quant. How'd you go? Mm. Are you going out to mm. Do you want something to eat? Mm. And like their arms go into magnets on the floor, their shoulders slump over, they suddenly go. <laughs> and everything, oh, aren't they so undone by for those years? But you know what? 
As for me and my house, I'll read and serve the Lord. Amen. That's what scripture says. You will smile whether we like it or not. We're going to have fun. So often it's in that period that even kids go through a lot of aloneness. And the danger now is they've got the blimmin' internet. And they get their comfort from the internet, from some weird and wacky stuff online from a bloke out in Tennessee living in a basement married to a gun. And then they think that's normal. Oh, I might have been to the, married to the old dragon for a few years, but never a gun. Alright? No, sorry, sorry, love. No, I just mean you're firing me, not dragon fire. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> now during the days of Elijah the prophet, Israel was at war with the Amorites and the, and the king of Ammon sought to intercept the king of Israel. But Elijah uh, always alerted the king before the Amorites planned the attack. So the king of Ammon decided to eliminate Elijah and defeat the Israelites. Now, you've got to be careful that you don't let some people leave your life. You've got to know who to wave goodbye to at the door. There are some people you love, God bless you, everything else, but if you don't want to be in my life, there's the door, and it's not a healthy relationship. We'll meet up again in heaven. There are other people you've got to hang on to in your life. You don't let them leave because they're valuable, even if they're a pain. Even if they rebuke you, even when they don't agree with you, even if they bore you, there's some people you need in your life and you mustn't let them go. You've got to hold on to them because they can preserve your life. They're the ones God is speaking into your life through them. And you need them in your life. You don't have to like them, but you need them. And you've got to know who has God placed in my life and why. God spoke to me about somebody in the congregation this morning while I was in worship. I love worship because the Lord, apart from me ministering to the Lord, the Lord ministers to me. And I don't like to be disturbed in worship. Okay? Don't come and tap me on the shoulder and tell me the building's burning. Just leave me burn. Alright? Don't come in while I'm worshipping God. Okay? That's for me and the Lord. Okay? But a lot of the time the Lord will minister to you in worship as well. And the Lord said to me, this person I've called to be an intercessor in your life. One of you guys, believe it or not. I've called them to be an intercessor in your life. But I want you to speak to them and ask them to begin to intercede in the background in your life. So you've got to know why are people in your life. There's a bigger picture. There's eternal timetable in things, you know? And so you have to know why are why is this person in my life? What is God doing with them? So, uh, the king needed Elijah in his life. Why? Because it brought protection, it brought wisdom, it saw off the enemy, it preserved the Israelites as well. 2 Kings chapter 6, 2 Kings chapter 6. Whilst the servant, the man of God, got up and went out, Early the next morning, an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. And how often we get surrounded in life. Financial problems, health problems, relationship problems. You know, never, you'll never go short of finding a problem in life. There's always problems. When you've got a problem with nobody else, you've got a problem with yourself. There's always problems, you know? And he said, oh no, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Don't be afraid. You will react badly in fear, okay? You will react badly in fear. Do not make a decision in a corridor. Don't be put under pressure to make a decision, okay? Because you'll make the wrong one. If you're going to make a decision, make the right one, take your time. And don't make it out of fear. Okay? Don't make decisions out of fear. Make them wisely. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. 
those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, open his eyes, Lord, that he may see. Now, in the situation, the advice that the servant is getting is utter rubbish. It's nonsense. Look, they, they're coming to attack us. Look at all the horses. Look at the chariots. What are we going to do? He's saying, what way should we run? Because we're outnumbered. We're surrounded. We're really in big trouble. But the man of God says, do not be afraid. The servant must be thinking, you're mad. You're mad. Are you not seeing what I'm seeing? No, the prophet was seeing exactly what the servant saw. The problem was the servant could not see all that the prophet saw. Amen? The prophet could see more than the servant because the prophet had spiritual insight to the situation the servant didn't. He was judging the situation by what was on his left and his right. And sometimes you're judging the situation in the natural by what's around you. You've got to put your spiritual vision on and say, right, what's happening spiritually? What's actually going on here spiritually? And sometimes that's why I don't give up on people. Because in the natural, sometimes people will look at me and say, why do you even bother with that person? Because I can see what's happening supernaturally. Oh, in the natural, it's a waste of time. But supernaturally, there's something happening. There's something down the road that this person is going to encounter or go into. I can see it prophetically, and that's why I won't walk away. You've got to know. Instead of just coasting along in life, live life. Don't just let their colour take you anywhere. You know? It doesn't matter how big you and strong you think you are. I watched a film the other day on one of these old TV channels. I didn't watch it all. And uh, Frank Sinatra was in it, and somebody else. Gregory Peck or whoever it was, and they're moving a cannon from one place across the river to the next place. And as they move this cannon, the ropes break. And as big as this cannon is, and it's on a wooden platform, the colour takes the cannon. And there's nothing they can do. Stop living life on the current. You're just living life being taken by the current all the time. Live life on purpose. Plan. If you want God to do something, start talking to him, start planning. Live a life according to the calling. Well, if you believe God's going to do it, start living according to it. Prepare yourself, that's faith. Or, you're just being blown around, around all the time, you're not really going to get anywhere. And you won't get past your hurts. You just won't, because you're just being blown away. There are some times there's power in making a decision. I've been around this man in long enough. I've been around this issue of rejection long enough. I've been around this disappointment long enough. I've dealt with it. I've carried this bag of, uh, bag of rubbish long enough. And sometimes the healing isn't, Lord, come and heal, it, heal me in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the healing comes when you make the decision, just let go of it. Just put it down. That's finished. It's yes to you. Yes, it was injustice. Yes, it was wrong. Yes, it was hurtful. Yes, it's not right. But you're still carrying it around everywhere. It's not, it's not carrying around to smell a pair of trainers. And wherever you go, and you moan about the smell all the time, but you still take it with you in your heart. You know? And sometimes you've just got to say, no, do you know what? I'm leaving that across. Jesus purchased that. And all the injustice and all what people think, they can keep all that as well. I'm free. I'm moving on to what God has got planned for me. You know, we celebrate yesterday, we live in today, we plan for tomorrow. Amen? Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. They were by themselves in the natural, but they were not alone. Amen? You might be by yourself, surrounded by the enemy of death and frustration and distraction and depression and all these things. But although you, you're by yourself, you are not alone. And sometimes you've got to say, Lord, open my eyes so that I can see what I've got, so I can see what's around. I need to see spiritually to win the battle. 
When David beat Goliath, all, all the entire Israeli army had their eyes on Goliath. David had his eyes on God. It's where you place your focus. What are your eyes on? Your eyes on the Goliath or are your eyes on God? And sometimes we just got to get our eyes off of Goliath and put our eyes on the Lord. You know? There will always be problems. There may be trouble ahead. You know? Why are you laughing at it? Why do that on TikTok? Um, but, you know, it's what you do with it. It's what you do. There will always be troubles. Life comes at you. We live on the earth. Things happen. We're not... We, we get wounded. We get hurt. But when you realise, oh, I'm in a battle, that's a bit different. See, a footballer on a football pitch, when the crowd starts throwing missiles and, and bottles at him and everything else, he goes down on the floor, he's just like collapses or, or whatever, he's, he's, he's out the game, he can't cut, he's looking at the crowd in shock and he doesn't know what's going on and he's like, where did it, why is this happening to me? But a soldier, put a soldier in his military gear on the football pitch and they're chucking stuff at him, he's like, bring it on, kaboom, who's next? Because he knows he's in a battle, he knows what he's been trained for. Renaldo ain't been trained for that. You know? And that's the difference. And we know we're not alone. We might be by ourselves. When you're in that doctor's waiting room and they give you that terrible news, you're by yourself. You're not alone. You're not alone. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead resides in you. And when you were at that conference and you had that great touch and hallelujah, shandai, shandai, Andrew, my bow tie, and it was fantastic. Do you know what? It's the same Holy Spirit that was with you at that meeting who is also with you when you've got constipation sitting on the toilet. Good days or bad days, it's the same Holy Spirit. But we seem to elevate him depending on our situation. Well, why are you laughing your head off? But do you understand what I'm saying? But we seem to empower the Holy Spirit when we're in a wonderful meeting, there's an outpouring, oh, I've got more of God and God's got more of me and everything else. And we go out the door and all the power's gone. You know, not in my life, mate. Whether I'm in the midst of worship or whether I'm on the job, I'm full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I know the power of God alive and at work in my life, you know? I want to be stronger, I want to be better, I want to be more sensitive, I want to grow in the things of God. I've preached for years, since I was 19 years old, I've preached. There have been some years that I've preached almost 52 weeks in a year, every Sunday, you know? I'm still learning from the Word of God, loving, wonderful. So although he was by himself, he wasn't alone. And we need to look around and see. Not only, not only were the hills full of horses, but they were filled with chariots of fire. Hallelujah. These weren't normal chariots. These were chariots of fire. Amen. There's chariots of fire around us. There's the angelic realm around us. There's the angels that are sent to minister to you. Ministering angels are with you. Amen? Holy Spirit has filled you with his presence. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came for purpose of the miracle or the situation and retracted. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit came and flooded the church and did not retract. Because Jesus said, never will I leave you, nor will I uh, forsake you. And he said, I'm sending one who is going to come and be with you and be your comforter and be your guide and so on and so forth. And so we have that with us all the time. We just don't tap in to our relationship properly. Jesus in his earthly ministry was alone several times. And he encountered loneliness. John wrote in his Gospel, John chapter 1 verse 10. John chapter 1 verse 10. He was in the world, and through him the world was made. The world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but they didn't receive him. And he took massive rejection. 
We read in Matthew 4, Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights alone in the wilderness without food. Then he was tempted. You know, and what is temptation? Temptation is you're weighing up whether to do it or not. There are some things that I'm not tempted by. Don't tempt me. You know, eating spinach. Don't tempt me. <laughs> I can walk past that bowl of spinach all day long. I won't even look twice. I'm not tempted by it. But you go down to Sandra and you have a bit of that homemade trifle, you've got a problem. Because <laughs> I'll be tempted by it. If I don't buy one, they should have dug a swimming pool and let me swim in the bloody trifle. <laughs> I love trifle. That will tempt me. And sometimes we don't understand what temptation is. You know, temptation, Jesus was tempted. Shall I, shan't I? He was in the quandary. He was tempted in all things known to man. Yet, he was without sin. Wow. Wow. So he knows our temptations to step away. He knows what pain is. Jesus experienced a deep sense of loneliness when John the Baptist died. Jesus experienced the deep sense of aloneness on the night in the Garden of Gethsemane. He wanted his disciples. He said, look, pray for me while I go over there. You stay here and pray. And it's the one time he actually needed them. He never needed them before. The one time he needs them, he says, stay awake and pray. What do they do? Fall asleep. And it's almost like he wanted them. He needed them. But as much as he wanted and needed them, he knew what he was going to have to face. He had to face it alone. His sin always separates, but forgiveness brings reconciliation. That's when you know there's true forgiveness, because there's reconciliation. When he was arrested that same night, Judas would betray him, Peter would deny him, disciples all got up and ran away. They fell asleep when he needed them most. Jesus, when he was dying on the cross, cried out to the <coughs> Father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And for the first time in eternity, God himself turns his back on Jesus. And Jesus experiences complete aloneness and isolation. Now, if you really want to uh, understand what Jesus went through, if you read Psalm 22, which is the prophetic psalm of Jesus' suffering on the cross, and you read that and you begin to understand the depth that he went through. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry out by day and you do not answer by night and I'm silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put our trust. They trusted in you. Then you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and they were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults at me, shaking their heads. He trusted the Lord, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me. The trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many balls surround me. Strong balls of Bashan, that's the demonic realm, encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey with their mouths open wide against me. I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint and my heart has turned to wax and melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shred, and my tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. You lay me down in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments amongst them, and they cast lots for my clothing. But you, O oh God, be not far off. 
I, my strength, come quick to help me deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion and save me from the horn of the wild ox. Wow, what a prophetic statement of Jesus' suffering on the cross. And he goes on from that to worship God. He doesn't sit in self-pity and say, well, oh, he had every right to sit in self-pity, but he doesn't. Instead, the Psalm, uh, verse 22, he says, after all of that, he then goes the antidote. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. You descendants of Jacob, honour him. For he has not disdained nor rejected the sufferings of the Holy One. He has heard his plea for help. Hallelujah. And that's the antidote sometimes. You just worship. It's just going to the Lord. Corinthians says, just as there is one body, there are many parts of which we are all connected. 1 Corinthians 12. Beautiful. Verse 12 to 20. And you read about the symmetry of the body of Christ knitted together. But guys, you've got to be more honest. You've got to be, well, if I say I'm having a bad hair day, what will people think of me? You know? Or the other way around. What, what? Well, imagine the people in church if they knew what you were really like. Huh? You look all right on a Sunday with your wall paint on, but what about in the week? You know? But that's love. We accept each other. You know? In the evening, you, your wife looks beautiful, you go out for a meal, and she looks beautiful, and she's lovely, and you're in the restaurant, and you're looking at each other, and you just think, oh, blessed man you are to have this wife and it's brilliant. You go home, you have a little kiss and it's lovely and you smell her perfume. Nine hours later when she wakes up and you move anywhere near the vicinity of the mouth and it's dog breath. And it's like, hello, oh my God. You know, and the hair is like all skew with. And actually her head is on back to front. You know, it's totally skew with. And the snoring, the snoring start, starts. You know what? Irrespectively. The body of Christ, if you're going to get upset because people have got imperfections, you'll always be upset. You don't say people's imperfections are right, but you say, despite your imperfections, I accept you. Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus said, whilst you were dead in your sin, Christ died for you. Whilst you were dead in it, Christ died for you. And sometimes we're all too keen to point out the imperfections in each other and also in the bride of Christ. Be careful what you say about, I'm not saying this church, but the bride of Christ. We have to be careful. It might be ugly, it might be scruffy, but it's still his bride. The bride don't always look good. You ever see the cartoons when you were a kid where the, the, the couple were going to get married? And she's got the veil from this, from her eyes down, and she looks all beautiful up here. But you lift that veil up, and she's got a mouth like that little tunnel, and her nose like corn Mark, that's a warning. That's not a warning. That's not a warning. I'm not giving that. But you know what I'm saying? Oh my gosh. I know we say. You know what? Despite everything, we've got to be willing to play our part. Despite everything. Despite my disappointments, despite my mistrust, despite my vulnerability, despite my moments of doubt, I've still got to be willing to play my part, put my hands to the plan, to give all that I am to him. What you do with it, you'll be accountable for. But I'm giving it to him. And that's what you've got to remember. We serve the Lord through each other. We love God through each other and being obedient. That's how we love God. That's how we do it. You know? But if you're not going to give yourself to each other, then you're not giving yourself to the Lord. And it's painful and it hurts and it's just like any relationship. You know? But sometimes there's just some things you've got to accept. People will let you down. People will have good intentions and not follow through on it. Some people will betray you. Didn't stop Jesus going to the cross, did it? 
He said, whilst his hand was in the bowl with he who would betray him. Wow. While his hand was in the bowl, they're sharing an intimate meal and he's looking at him and he knows he's the betrayer. He knows exactly what he's going to do and yet he still eats with him. And you know what? He so covered Judas in love that when, when Jesus turns around and says, one of you are going to betray me, nobody said, oh, it's Judas. It's what? It's that blimmin' Judas. I could see it coming a mile away. I knew what he was like. Do you know what? They said, oh, who's it going to be? Who's going to... They didn't suspect. If, if I'd been Jesus, and I knew Judas was going to do that, I would have said, you've got one guess. <laughs> <laughs> Just one, that's all you need. All right? And I would have put Judas right outside. The last blimmin' supper, last supper, Judas, let's be your last blimmin' breath, you traitor. <laughs> right, and you, Peter, you can put your pipe down and all get out. With the other traitor, do you know what I mean? Because we're human and we want to. But Jesus so loved Judas that none of it, it wasn't obvious that he was the betrayer. I don't know why I'm picking on you today, Nicky, sorry about that. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> It's important for us as a church to grow and move in the things of God. Guess what? It's your responsibility, not mine. Amen? It's not my responsibility. It's our responsibility because we are the body. And I'm going to play my part. I'm not committed because I'm the pastor. I'm committed because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. That's where my passion comes from. That's where my commitment comes from. Not because I'm a leader, not because I'm a pastor, not because of any other reason than that. I'm committed because I love Jesus and I love his people, although they get on my nerves every now and then. But I love them, especially that jacket. She's what a good But do you know what I'm saying? Now imagine if I turn around and say, well, do you know what? I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to sit back a bit. You know? People will be, ooh, all the complaints will start coming in. But we fail to see the importance, and Paul gave the importance in Romans chapter 1, verse 11. I long to see you that I might impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest amongst you, just as I have had amongst the Gentiles. So Paul's point is this, I long to see you so that I might impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. Amen? So when we meet together and we fellowship together and we iron sharpens iron, it causes spiritual giftings to be given and to, to start something. The iron sharpens iron, okay? But also when iron sharpens iron, it causes a spark. And that spark causes a flame. Something happens. You haven't got... Me and Ricky can be down in the dumps on our own. He's had a terrible week, fed up with Jane, fed up with the children, fed up with work, fed up with being fed up and everything else. I'm the same the other end. And we, you put me and Ricky together and within, what, 15 minutes you've got a Holy Spirit party going on. We're talking vision, we're talking how we're getting out of this, we're talking about going back and loving our wives, we're talking about this, that and that. And we just, it just happens. And we've sharpened each other and we're going, Right, that's been done for another week then. Right, maybe I won't chuck the job in this week. And off we go. And that's what happens. There's a purpose in it. And remember, in closing, be alert to the ploy of the enemy. And his ploy is to kill, steal and destroy and to prevent and separate and hold you down. That's his purpose. Stop you fulfilling your destiny. And David, in I think it's Luke or Matthew, it says David fulfilled the purposes of God in his generation. Oh, what a joy. Just to fulfill the purposes of God. To go home empty. Job done. It's finished. 
I fulfilled the purposes of God. All what the Lord had planned for me to do, job done, finished, gold star, get your mansion. Or mud hut, whatever the Lord assigns to you. Wouldn't that be lovely? Rather than to go and think, oh, well, I could have done that, and if I was a bit bolder, and if I was a whisker, and just, just die empty. Die empty. You are living your dash right now. You're in the dash. So on your tombstone, if you're lucky enough to have one, or whatever we decide to do with you, because uh, you won't have a choice, you'll be dead. So uh, you will have Fred Boyle, date of birth, 1952, dash, that's where you are now. You're in that dash. And then it will have your date of death. Okay? 2058, 7 o'clock, whatever, run out of time. So right now, all of us have got a date of birth. We've all got that. We haven't got our date of death yet. Although, I beg to differ. We haven't got our date of death yet. Not yet. Because you're alive. Okay? If you've got a pulse, you're alive. If you've got no pulse, you're probably still alive. But you're still there. But you will have your date of death. So therefore, you are living right now your dash. That's where you're living, in your dash. Live that dash to the full. Live that da don't let that dash be a dot. Make sure it's a dash. And live your dash to the full. Because you don't know the date that goes at the end. None of us know. For some, we'll be raptured and there'll be no date. For others, the body will just give up its... its Breath, and they're going to be with the Lord, and there will be a day. So therefore, we are all in the dash. You live in that dash, why not? And you can't change it. That's the trouble. It's not like a video recorder where you can rewind. You can't rewind. You can't get back yesterday's glory. It's gone. You can't get it back. You can look back with joyful memories or miserable memories, whatever it is, but you can't change it. It's happened. You can't rewind the dash. You're living it now, live it to the full. Just like Paul, there's 20 things you've got beautiful. Live that dash, pal. Live it to the full. In closing, John 14, 25. All this I have spoken to you whilst still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. Wow. So we're actually in control of a troubled heart, an unhealed heart, a damaged heart, and we're actually in control of fear. Because Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. See, the heart is the, the seed of our, the centre of your being. The issues of life flow, flow from the heart. And it can be really healthy, despite the things you've been through and been around, you know? It can just keep going. Have you seen that shit, really stupid film, uh, That Place? Have you ever seen that place? Go Google that place, you've seen it. Go Google that place. And in this comedy, with Mr Bean in it, this film that place, there's a guy and he's transferred, he's a medical uh, ambulance driver and he's moving live organs around America for people who need them. And he's driving and he runs over Mr Bean. So Mr Bean needs a lift. So he gives Mr Bean a lift. And as they're riding along, this, this ambulance driver says, oh, do you know, do you know what I've got in, in the back, at, at the back of the van, just there? Mr. B's like, what have you got, what have you got? He says, organs. I'm taking them to the hospitals for people. And that's why I've got the, the lights, I can go through all the traffic, because it's got these all, they're very precious. And he's like, Mr. B's like, oh. <laughs> he says, uh, do you want to? Do you want to have a look? Do you want to have a look at a heart? Really? Should we? Well, I heard just a little look. 
and they picked this heart up, and this heart is pulsating, <laughs> life on it, and all of a sudden they swerve and they drop the heart on the floor, and it's down by his feet, and he can't pick it up. And then finally they, they pick it up, but Mr. Bean's got the window open, they hit another curb, and it flies out the window. And so they have to stop, and they're running around the side of the road looking for this heart. And then the dog comes along, and it gets the heart, and it runs up, up the hill with it. And eventually they, they get the dog, and they get the heart back, and they've got all these extra and they say, is it Maryland in this? All these extra holes in this, and everything else. He says, hey, is, it, is it still working? It doesn't seem to be doing anything. And he puts his hand on an electric fence by accident. <laughs> and it sparks the heart back into pulsating. And I'm saying that to say, no matter how damaged you think your heart is, spark of the Holy Spirit, don't matter how many holes, how much damage, that's all you know. It's all you need. And it'll start pumping pulsating again. Know that you are never alone. And guess what? We are equipped for all that we have to go through in life. God knew what you would have to go through and he's equipped you for it. You are never alone. Pursue him in such a way that honours him and pursue each other. Okay? Pursue each other. In America, when there's a car chase, they used to watch loads of American TV in the 80s and they used to love it. The Dukes of Hazard. The Dukes of Hazard, Starksy and Hutch and all things like that. The A-Team, I grew up on all of that, I loved it. And he used to love it, they go, 10-4, 10-4, and we're in hot pursuit of whatever. And do you know what? God wants us to be in hot pursuit. You can be in pursuit, that means you, you've got to, you're, you're on a purpose. But when you're in hot pursuit, nothing else matters. You're going to take some risks. You're in hot pursuit. And we've got the you in pursuit, or are you in hot pursuit? Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that we, we, we would be in hot pursuit of you, Lord. That, Lord, when we are alone, when we are by ourselves, we are not alone. Never would you leave us. Never would you forsake us. Lord, let us realise the gift that other people are in our lives as well, Lord God. Father, we ask for healing, healing of our hearts, Lord, damaged, broken, disappointed, whatever it is, Lord. Father, cause us to be a people of God that turn up, not just in body, but in spirit and in mind and in heart, Lord God, that our motives are right, Lord God. Thank you that you've equipped us to have peace. It's within our ability for our hearts not to be troubled. Even Jesus said, Martha and Mary, you are, you are troubled by many things. Even his mother, Mary, Father, he said she pondered these things in her heart and she stored them up in her heart, Lord God. But Jesus, we've given our hearts to you. We receive a new heart. A heart that's not troubled. A heart that can look at a situation facing the injustice but yet never lose its passion for you. That's the, that's the love that we want, Lord. We want to be like Judas in our, in Jesus in our relationships with Judas. As in, even when people hurt us, it's not obvious. We're not bitter. We just get better. Because we can see a bigger picture. We ask Holy Spirit that we will be more conscious of you. We will look to you. Lord, we don't just want to fulfil your will, but we want to fulfil it your way. We want to present things to you exactly the way that you desire to think, to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah.